We're now going to look at a game featuring a very nice king hunt, which is perhaps one that will go down in history as one of the best games that's ever been played. It's actually a fairly recent game uh, from 2017. Uh, this was the game Jin Shi Bai versus Liren Ding uh, from the Chinese Team Championship 2017. Uh, white began with d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop b4, so it was a Nimzo Indian defense. Knight f3, castles, bishop g5, and black struck at the center with c5. And now white played e3, supporting the d4 pawn and preparing to develop the bishop. c takes d4, and he chose to take with the queen. Well, we see in this game at a number of points in the opening, it takes two to create a brilliancy. White makes some rather risky and rather uh, ambitious decisions uh, in, a, in a couple of points. Uh, so there are several points where if White chose a more cautious approach, uh, no such brilliancy as what happened would, would have occurred. And this is what takes place in a lot of games. Uh, always there's something hidden that could have happened, but uh, it doesn't always manifest itself. So here, for instance, white could have taken on d4 with the pawn, which has happened, which had happened before, uh, but then black plays d5, and then such a position, c takes d5, e takes d5, is probably not going to lead to any kind of uh, game similar to what happened. Of course, there could be something, uh, the game could go many ways, but the position is very static with it both sides having isolated pawns in the center. White chose to play queen takes d4, intending to keep uh, more pressure on the d-file, uh, to keep more pressure in the center, and to avoid immediately activating this bishop. Uh, so black played knight c6, and another point was he played queen to d3. Another rather ambitious move here. This was, I believe, a novelty. Uh, Queen h4 is natural, but again, after h6, no such game as what happened would have happened. White would have to take on f6, and then uh, it would result in an endgame like this, with black having two bishops and potential pressure on the c-file in the future, uh, but also doubled pawns. Uh, this was uh, had happened before, but white avoided this with queen to d3 in order to maintain the pin on the knight on f6. So now black played h6. Bishop h4, d5. So black strikes back in the center. He needs to get some, some freedom there and to develop the bishop. And here, rook to d1, white chose in order to put pressure on the d-file. Uh, he'd like to induce black to take on c4, in which case white would have uh, would easily complete his development with bishop e2 and castles and then bring his rooks to the center with more uh, activity for white. C takes d5 would be natural, but after e takes d5, black has pretty f free play here. Uh, there's an isolated queen pawn, uh, but the white queen is uh, slightly exposed on d3, and probably black's going to continue as in the game with the same aggressive fashion, but the bishop is free to come to f5 then afterwards. So that's why white avoided taking on d5, instead preferring to pressure the pawn some more, not allowing the bishop on c8 into the game yet. Now... Black has to strike back uh, because uh, white intends to simply play bishop e2 in castles and eventually to take on d5 at the right moment. So black needs to use the fact that white is still uh, behind in development to um, get uh, his acti to allow his activity to lead somewhere. And so he had to weaken his king's side to break the pin and allow the knight to jump into e4. But this is actually very common in these kinds of positions, that g5, which is, of course, a double-edged move, but, to, but this sometimes needs to be played. Bishop g3, knight e4. So black puts pressure on c3, and white played knight to d2. So he wants to uh, try to remove the knight. These are all very even well-known patterns, even though this position is a new position, and I don't believe preparation was a, an element, uh, at least uh, in this position, in this game. I don't think that the that the players were uh, playing any kind of preparation. Uh, I don't think that uh, Dean Laren's uh, incredible sacrifice was preparation, which we're going to see. Is, I don't think it was preparation. Uh, 
uh, but these are still very common maneuvers. Knight to d2 is a very typical maneuver, maneuver for these kind of positions. He needs to uh, break the pin and disturb the knight on e4. If instead sim the white simply completes the development with bishop e2, again, no brilliancy would have occurred as happened in the game, but black would have just stepped up the pressure on c3 with queen f6 or queen a5 perhaps, and uh, would eventually take the pawn on c3, and it's uh, likely that white will be struggling to get compensation. He may regain his pawn on d5 but afterwards, but uh, at the cost of uh, going into an endgame where black would end up with a 2 to 1 majority on the queen side and pretty active pieces, so white would definitely not have the advantage there. So he played knight to d2, and black for his part has to play concretely because here if he doesn't achieve something, his king side will be weakened permanently. So it's, uh, this, has, uh, this g5 move has really sharpened the game. Uh, so just taking on c3, for instance, b takes c3, the bishop has to move, and now some move just, for instance, bishop e2, uh, and uh, black is going to have cause to regret the g5 move because he hasn't achieved anything. Uh, white doesn't uh, even really have doubled pawns. His, his pawns are not weak. Um, so black's position is much worse, very difficult here. So he needs to play concretely, and that's why he played knight c5, hitting the white queen, queen to c2, and now d4. So the game really heats up here, because white's king is still in the center, but if black doesn't, uh, uh, if black doesn't get an initiative, uh, the position will turn against him. So here certainly white can't take on d4, because after knight takes d4, black's pieces would be too active. This would be very white would not be able to complete his development and would uh, probably just be lost very quickly after e5 following up and then bishop f5 so white had to play knight f3 utilizing the pin on the d file to pressure black there now the pawn on d4 is under attack so black has to continue with e5 so he began with this move First point is, well, he definitely intended the, the queen sacrifice that we will soon see, but this move was necessary to play this first so that white won't have a knight guarding d2, and also so this bishop is open. As we'll see, this was a necessary preliminary move. And here, white can't afford to simply not capture the pawn on e5, because if black keeps this pawn on d4, uh, white can't just uh, play bishop e2, for instance, because black's central position is now very strong uh, so he can in fact play a move like probably queen f6 uh, when this pawn the knight is now hanging on uh, on c3 and it's it's pinned and so white's uh, white's um, losing there so after e5 white had to take and call black's bluff and now the point of black's play, which is forced at this point. Well, actually, I think there's a move rook e8 also possible here. But uh, uh, Ding Liren sacrificed his queen with d takes c3, leading to really fascinating play. It's uh, not totally clear at this point that, uh, in fact, uh, objectively speaking, black isn't better. But such a sacrifice can be very unsettling. And it's uh, often a phenomenon in chess that when that this, the sacrifice, or even if the position is not better for him, often gets a boost, a psychological boost, as the opponent's head starts to spin and begins to fear being uh, the uh, victim of a brilliancy. Uh, so in this case, in this sense, even though it's still objectively about an equal position, if white defends correctly in the coming moves, um, black is the one making the creative play and white's the one reacting here. So white had to take the queen, and now black throws in c takes b2 with check. It's important, of course, to uh, obtain this pass pawn and clear and open up the the, uh, the diagonal for the bishop. This is part of black's compensation. So here white faced a, a very important decision. It's not act, it, not so obvious uh, which move. He has two moves, king to e2 and rook to d2, and as it turned out, he chose wrongly, but it was it's it's easy to say afterwards. But uh, during the game, uh, it's not so simple to decide between these two moves. And rook to d two looks uh, 
dangerous for white as well. That is, it turns out rook to d2 was the correct move. Uh, white played king e2. Rook to d2 would allow him to hold the game. Uh, now black plays rook to d8, stepping up the pressure on d2. And here white has several moves that are leading to a more or less equal endgame. So he could remove this very dangerous pawn by queen takes b2. He has no way to uh, to keep uh, the um, he has no way to keep the uh, queen. I mean, he's going to have to give back the queen after black takes on d2 in any case. Uh, so, for instance, bishop d3 is met by knight takes e5, and this uh, now if uh, white takes on e5, then the bishop also falls on d3. So that's not good for white. Uh, so queen takes b2, removing the pawn is one possibility. Rook takes d2. Now, of course, white has to take, has to give back the queen uh, by queen takes b4, because otherwise there's no hiding from the discovered check. So queen takes b4, uh, knight takes b4, and king takes d2. In this position, white's up a pawn still, but, well, black will be able to uh, eventually take on a2. Uh, probably not immediately, Is probably it's best not to take it immediately, but rather to uh, increase black's development with bishop f5 or perhaps bishop e6. And black is, uh, perhaps I would take the black side here. Uh, he has the initiative still, even in the end game, there's still some threats. So I don't think white's quite equal here. I, I'm, and this was, uh, these kind of positions look dangerous. So queen takes b2 might not be the best move. Um, it's probably better to play knight f3, defending on d2. So black's only move now is to remove the defend the uh, defender, bishop g4, to prepare to remove the knight, and only now take on b2. In this case, black has to give up the two bishops. Bishop takes f3, g takes f3, and then still black has to recover the, uh, the piece. Otherwise, white white's planning to uh, take, uh, uh, for instance, on um, on b4 is one, but also white, black has no way to step up the pressure, so he has to take. In this case, white can take with the queen because there will be no knight, no knight e4 check and there's no knight hanging on e5, as in the other variation. Bishop takes. Um, black could also consider other moves here, like rook to d8, uh, because the queen's not running away. But uh, it's not really better for black either takes, king takes. Here's another position where, again, white is still up a pawn, um, but it's not a very valuable pawn and black has a lot of activity. Here I think it's much safer for white than in the previous variations. Black will play rook to d8, probably then uh, something like king to c1, knight to b4, these kinds of moves. So black will eventually regain the pawn and it's uh, likely that somehow that white should be okay there. So rook to d2, while it's not totally simple, would have been better, as we'll see, than the game. But it's a hard decision to make. Uh, and white decided to play the more ambitious move, first of all, because he's keeping his queen after king e2. But he's also, um, he was might have been afraid of some of those variations. So here rook takes d8, and white has to remove the pawn on b2. Otherwise, black is threatening, for instance, to check on d2 and then queen the pawn. Um, so he has to remove that pawn. And now, very important follow-up for black. It's one of the points of king e2 is if, well, black doesn't have something here, actually, even though black's not down a lot of material, it's he has a rook and a minor piece for the queen. Uh, he's not down a lot of material, but if he doesn't find the right follow-up, his position is going to fall apart. So white's threatening knight takes c6 and to take the bishop. Um, and uh, even if black makes the move that saves the bishop, white will still take, and then queen f6 will be coming, for instance, and bishop e5, so white will have a counterattack on the king's side. Don't forget that black's own king is also open. Regaining the queen by rook to d2 wouldn't wouldn't be very good for black either, and that's certainly not what uh, Ding Liren was planning. That's not what he did, of course. White would take, bishop takes, uh, then can throw in knight takes c6, b takes c6, king takes c2, and white's just up a pawn with two bishops, and here uh, he's uh, just just winning. Uh, 
uh, well, black can grab the bishop on g3, knight e4, knight takes g3, but white's still winning there as well. This should be a matter of technique. Uh, so he didn't do that. Instead, black pursued the initiative with knight a4. Very strong and only move, really, to uh, give black an advantage. The knight comes to c3 with gain of time. So white has to move the queen. He played queen c2. Uh, one little point also, knight takes c6 doesn't equalize because after knight takes b2, knight takes d8, um, black has bishop a5 and the knight's trapped. And black then stays up a piece. So queen to c2, white played, knight to c3 check, and white has to run the king to f3. So the king hunt begins, basically the subject of our, our DVD. And now... Again, white's planning to take on c6, and then maybe bishop e5, interrupting black's whole setup. And if white can complete his development with just knight takes c6, bishop e5, or bishop d3, black's attack won't really be going anywhere. Uh, so again, it was necessary for black to have a very strong follow-up. And what he played was a beautiful move, rook to d4. A fantastic move controlling the fourth rank, threatening g4 with then mate, knight takes g4, bishop takes g4, mate. Also, white's again prevented from capturing on c6 because again g4 or bishop takes g4 is mate. And of course, if white, the point is if white takes on d4, then knight takes d4 and black takes the queen. So very strong follow-up, which most likely Ding Liren had to see when he sacrificed the queen, or even earlier. Uh, so here, to stop g4, white played h3. Uh, but rook to d4, so he stopped black's threat, but rook to d4 has controlled the fourth rank, and now came another strong follow-up, h5, renewing the threat of g4. So white again... The same variations didn't work for white, so he had to make room for his king, bishop h2, but this is very awkward. Now the king is going to have to run along to g3 and eventually to h4. So black continued with g4, chasing the king further. White would love to play g4 himself and obtain an escape for the king on g2, but he's not given the chance to do that, so black has to continue quickly. Now king g3, white played. He could take on g4, black would have taken back with a pawn, but as we'll see, uh, the open h file would make it even um, a quicker win for black. So white kept the h file closed, king g3. And now again, black had to have a very concrete follow-up. It's actually not, uh, it's, it's not uh, as if black has multiple wins here, really. In fact, I think in this position, there's only one way to win, which was the very beautiful move that Ding there and played. Uh, White's threatening to take on c6 and then to take the rook. He's threatening just to take the rook immediately as well. So the rook is hanging and White's getting ready to um, make some squares for his king to escape, for instance, uh, to make an escape for the king on g1 if necessary by bishop g1 if if black, if nothing else. But also, but mainly the knight on c6 and the rook on d4 are White's ready to, to take those and remove black's attackers. So Ding Liren's follow-up was rook to d2, another very powerful blow, hitting the white queen, and again a fork if the queen takes knight e4, and black wins the queen and stays up a piece. So the queen had to move. Uh, simple threat is to capture it. Uh, so white played queen to b3, and now Black continued to chase the king. Now the king has to go up the board with knight e4, forcing uh, king h4. If king f4, there was a nice, another nice conclusion possible. King f4, rook takes f2, and if white takes the knight, then bishop f5, king d5, rook to d8, with checkmate in two after white blocks on the d-file twice. There's no other squares for the king to run to. So king h4, white played. And now bishop e7. Black uses the chance to chase the king even further and forces white to take the h-pawn. So the h-file is opened up. 
king takes h5 and now there's i think multiple ways to win here but it's uh still you have to find one of them and ding uh, liran played very accurately with king to g7 so he prepares the slow but uh, not very slow thread of bishop f5 and rook h8 and it's surprisingly hard for white to do anything about this so for instance if white finally plays the move that he's been wanting to play ever since the queen was sacrificed knight takes c6 then comes bishop f5 and rook h8 is unstoppable uh, there's no checks by the queen bishop e5 f6 does nothing for white and again um and again, rook h8 is coming next. So, uh, so instead, white played bishop f4, planning to give the check on h6 with the bishop before black uh, brings his bishop out. Uh, and he'll have the opportunity to do that, but it's still not going to save him. So now bishop f5, even in such a crazy position, development is important. Black needs to get this bishop in for part of the attack and uh, threatens rook h8. So white had to play bishop h6 check, king h7. So white's managed to stop the immediate mate on the h file, but now he's threatened with other things, uh, especially, um, especially he has uh, Bishop g6, for instance, coming, well, primarily black's threatening knight takes e5, of course, just to take the knight, and then there'll be no stopping many uh, threats like bishop g6. If white's knight, if white finally captures on c6, then bishop g6 leads to mate. King takes g4, f5. King f4, bishop d6, forcing the block on e5, and now rook takes f2, mate another nice picture also if knight if knight takes f7 then the knight also has left e5 allowing bishop g6 king takes g4 and then simply bishop takes f7 is uh, the easiest win and here black's up material having two minor pieces and a rook against the queen and also a winning attack as well so that's no good for white so white played queen takes b7 the most disruptive move that can be seen at least black has to find something concrete here it's not a matter of black just taking on e5 because rook and bishop uh, while well, the knight's hanging uh, and white intends if the knight captures e5 to take on on e7 the rook is also hanging on a8 so really there has black has to find something concrete here and what ding liren found was a very nice rook takes f2 it seems uh, a little bit uh, like not the most priority move seems like there could be some other moves, but actually this is uh, the strongest because it removes the defender of g3. So simple threat is knight to g3 mate. It's not easy for white to stop this threat. Uh, in fact, it's almost impossible. There's only bishop g5, the move he played. He has queen takes e7, giving up the queen, but that's hopeless. Uh, black remains up, uh, up a rook. Uh, so there's bishop g5, the move he played resorting to the this almost absurd kind of move clearly white's lost after that uh, although it's still not so simple we black still needs to find something as we'll see there's also rook to f4 but the bishop f4 but this would just be met by rook takes f4 renewing the threat of knight g3 mate so he played bishop g5 an almost absurd looking move but black actually still has to be accurate here because if he takes with a bishop on g5 then f7 is hanging with check and that turns the tables. Uh, also, if uh, the knight takes g5, then there is no, um, then white can take, I think, on c6. There's no mate on g3. Knight to g3 check allows king h4. So black has to be very accurate still. And he played rook h8, bringing the last attacker in and preparing king g7 check. So here, king g7 is uh, is a almost unstoppable threat white took on f7 to at least attack the rook on h8 uh, otherwise a move like queen takes c6 for instance uh, could be met by um, for instance uh, the move king 
to g8. So that bishop h6 is in check. So this is now white's in check. Bishop h6, knight g3 mate. So that's a nice variation. Of course, white can block with a queen on h6, but that's also hopeless. Uh, so you know, white uh, doesn't have too many defenses to, to black just moving the king. So he played knight takes f7, uh, trying to... Um, trying to... Oh, by the way, also bishop e7, king g7 doesn't stop the threat of mate. So knight takes f7, at least so that black rook on h8 is hanging. But now came a very fine finish. Black diverted the knight, first by checking on g6, king takes g4, and now knight e5 check. And white resigned in this very beautiful picture, uh, because if the knight takes on e5, then the knight is no longer attacking the rook. So here black can mate by bishop f5, check, king h5, king g7, followed by checkmate, bishop h6, rook takes h6, checkmate. Or if after knight e5, white played the other legal move, king h4, then another beautiful finish. Um, so white refuses to take the knight on e5 and allow the rook on h8 to live, but that's okay because this knight is overworked. It has to attack on h8, but also be ready to capture on g g5. So black can win by king to g8 check. This is important not to g7. King g7 would be a terrible mistake losing, in fact, after knight takes h8 because the bishop is pinned on e7 and black's whole attack, and surprisingly there's no, black has nothing at all. But king to g8, so the bishop's not pinned, forces mate. White has to take the rook, or of course if knight h6, then the rook can capture because the bishop is pinned and this is checkmate. Or if knight takes h8, then bishop takes g5 with another beautiful checkmate with black using all of his minor pieces. Um, note that the rook actually wasn't wouldn't be really necessary in this position, so it's not a pure mate, but it's uh, uh, still extremely aesthetic finish, I think. So I think this game will go down as one of the best games in history, maybe not quite of the same level as the famous Kasparov versus Topolov game from Sarajevo, um, I think it was 2001, but, uh, or it was two, 1999, I forget, but um, this was still definitely one of the best games and a great addition to the uh, the heritage of chess. With one's king in the center, uh, there's always a danger of a sudden counterattack, even when you have a, a significant positional advantage. So you'll see here a, a, a very entertaining episode from uh, the end of my game uh, against a player named Hughes from Ohio 2009. Had the white pieces here. And I had misplayed the opening. It was uh, Rosalimo. And, uh, well, well, the Black King has to be watched carefully, but on the other hand, I have severe weaknesses of my light squares. And there's a danger that my king also can come under attack. So I was worried here about the move queen c6, which would give white very severe problems uh, with the uh, light squares, the long diagonal, where there's three pieces that are somewhat vulnerable. Uh, also, my rook is uh, trapped, more or less. Uh, so basically, it's, uh, and of course, black is also planning to take on b3 and expose the white king, perhaps with c4 coming later. So this is this is trouble for white, maybe not completely lost somehow, but it's, uh, it's trouble. But instead of playing queen c6, my opponent played f5, falling into the trap that I had set. And of course, I was very happy to see this move. It looks crushing. Uh, my rook is trapped. And uh, the B pawn is uh, pinned, so he can't. I can't take on C4. Uh, there's not enough pieces guarding it. And Rook takes C6 doesn't uh, doesn't even work. It looks like uh, Rook takes C6 uh, fails. It becomes uh, very uh, quickly becomes obvious. White doesn't have enough for a whole Rook. 
However, there's another way to get at the exposed king. And the key was to remove this important bishop on e7. And this resulted in white's attack becoming overwhelming as black's pieces were out of play. And then there was a further problem that black faced, which was that his queen's safety is dependent on dependent upon the rook on b8 staying in its position on b8, pinning the, the b-pawn. So that was a further problem that black had. So here, after f5, I broke through, and knight takes f5. So first this clears the e-file, both for my queen and also clears his e-pawn out of the way, so preparing the second sacrifice on the next move. And it destroys some of the shelter around the black king. So sudden tactical blow, which is made possible by the fact that white has more force, localized force, on the king's side and in the center. So he had to take, otherwise black's position is just destroyed. Uh, I would take on e7 or e6 next move. Uh, so the, the, he has to take that knight. Also, he if, he can't take on b3 because the c-pawn is pinned uh, horizontally. So there's no chance for him to throw in that move. So he took the knight, and now rook takes e7. This was the follow-up, uh, which of course had to be... Uh, had to be uh, the follow-up, otherwise white would just be down too much material. But this bishop was a very important defender of his dark squares and allows me then to continue the king hunt now after removing the bishop. So he took the, the rook, which was again forced. If uh, he just moves his king somewhere, like to f8, then not only am I winning just because uh, I've just won, uh, won a pawn for nothing, but also the black king is in serious trouble. And in fact, uh, there's a forced win with uh, accurate move queen e6, bringing the queen in, threatening mate on f7, sac forcing black now to take the rook. Of course, this move wasn't necessary, but this is the most accurate. Knight takes c7 is forced, and then knight to g5, threatening checkmate on f7. Uh, and uh, there's no good defense. For instance, if queen e8, defending f7, then queen f6, king g8, bishop c3, with uh, mate coming uh, mate coming on h8 or g7. Also after uh, knight g5, if he tries to run with the king, then rook to e1 is decisive. The knight is pinned and uh, threatened with checkmate. Queen takes e7, and queen to d7 would block the king's escape after queen f7. The bishop covers d8. So he took the, the rook, and uh, now I'm down an entire rook, but uh, with a queen and knight working together, the bishop sometimes also ready to take part in the attack, and even the pawns, it turns out, white's attack is sufficient. So first, knight to g5, and the black king stepped up, king to g6. So his other options were to go back. Obviously, king f8, queen e6 would be the same position as the previous variation, so that's why it's relevant in this case. I need to have this move. In the other case, I didn't have to sacrifice the rook, but here it's uh, already position is forced, and black loses, as we've seen. King e8 is, of course, more logical than king f8, but here uh, there's queen e5. In fact, after king f8, also, I think queen e5 was strong, but this in this case, uh, this, is, this is the strongest move in this position, forking the two rooks in a very... Uh, in a very dramatic form. Black can't uh, save the rooks by connecting them because after king d7, then queen e6, king e8, rook e1, and we've already seen that position as well. So, meanwhile, if he goes king f6, then queen e6 forces him to take the knight and leads to the variation we'll see in a moment. So he played king g6, where his king... Uh, has to step up, but uh, retains the most possibility of choice. Queen e6 check. So again, now I'm offering the knight on g5. So real, really a lot of sacrifice, um, but uh, it's clear that black won't survive. So he, he played king h5, dancing around the knight to try to hope that um, my own knight will impede my attack, because king takes g5 lost in a number of ways. I can't even remember, because it's a while which one I was planning. Um, bishop e2 looks, uh, bishop d2 rather looks very strong here. Um, he has to play f4. Uh, yeah, there's a number of different ways, but uh, 
I think H four is also more most likely the move that I was looks very natural and that the most likely the move I was planning. Uh, there's a number of ways to win, so I can't remember which one. But uh, now, if his king goes forward, king g4, queen e2 is mate, so he has to go to h5. And now I can just take the knight. And queen g5 checkmate is threatened, so there's no time for black to do anything. He has to guard against that by um, by a rook, or also h pawn. It results in the same thing. And now, after rook to h to g8, then Nice move g4. I don't remember seeing this, but this is this is, in this case, the uh, fastest way to mate. Although there's other wins as well. Uh, the point is that if Black takes on g4 with this either the rook or the pawn, then it's a self block, allowing me to take h7 and checkmate. If the king takes, then queen e2, king f4, bishop c7 is checkmate. And if the king goes back to g6, then h5. King h6, queen f6, and after rook g6, g5 is checkmate. So some nice variations, but there's many ways to win after king takes g4, and I can't remember which one. Bishop d2 also looks probably like the move that I would have seen during the game, and that certainly leads to a mate eventually. Uh, so instead he, he played king h5, avoiding this these mates, but uh, leaving the knight alive. And now queen f7, so I tried to insist that he takes the knight. Uh, so he played knight to g6. If he takes it now, in this case, um, in this case, uh, I probably would have taken the knight with check, and this, I think, is the fastest way now. King g6, queen e6, and if he comes up the board, then it's uh, h4 as well, or bishop d2. King g7 is met by bishop c3, and this this time the king gets uh, mated in the in the back. Uh, after king f8, there's queen f6 with a quick mate coming. So he played knight to g6, but now the king is chased further. I, I'm, I have time now to play a quiet move. Queen takes f5, relatively quiet. Here I'm down a rook, but I'm threatening most of all knight f7 checkmate but also knight e6 followed by queen to g5. So whichever way, if he attacks my queen that prepares to give the discovered check, either way, for instance, if he attacks with a rook, then knight f7 is checkmate, blocks the rook. If he attacks with the bishop, then knight e6 blocks the bishop and leads to checkmate on g5. And there's nowhere for the black king to go. King h6 is just met by, among various, among other things, knight f7, for instance, knight f7, king g7, bishop c3 was made shortly after. And probably also even faster would be knight e6, actually, with queen g5 being unstoppable. So instead he played knight e7, this way attacking the queen in a way that can't uh, block, can't be blocked, so thus avoiding a discovered check, but now I'm able to play g4. His king has to go further forward because if he goes to um, if he goes to h6, then queen f6, knight g6, knight f7, checkmate. King h4. Now I have knight f3, king h3, and again a quiet move relatively queen f4. But clearly black has several moves away from even a hint of counterplay, and there's no way to bring up pieces effectively. Queen g3 mate is a threat. The king can't run because of king g2, then obviously mate comes on g1, with the black king all the way on the other side of the board. So my opponent preferred knight f5. Uh, just, uh, well, of course I can I can certainly win by taking the knight, but uh, uh, more accurate was the move I played, rook to g1. Preparing queen to g3, or rook to g3, but most likely queen to g3 would have been my choice, and so here black resigned. Since there's no defense to that threat, he can give a couple spite checks, but they lead nowhere, and then comes the sacrifice on g3 and checkmate. So with the king in the center, even with uh, positional advantage, there's always something that one has to be careful. The attack can be, if unleashed, can be very strong, even with big sacrifices, such as what happened in this game. <laughs>
Although the queen is an integral piece in, in many attacks on the opposing king, uh, attacks can happen without the partic participation of the queen, even in the queenless middle games. And these types of attacks are often very interesting to see because it involves delicate maneuvers by smaller pieces rather than the sledgehammer that's, that is the queen. Uh, we'll see an example of this in a game Lajos Portis versus Josef Pinter from the 1984 Hungarian Championship. Very beautiful game, which is not very well known. There are some flaws. It, it turns out that, uh, from my analysis, uh, it seems Portish could have actually refuted Black's attack with an amazing idea, uh, but uh, this doesn't really detract from the game, uh, which is still nevertheless very fascinating. So the game began with a semi tarash defense, c5, c takes d5, knight takes d5, e4. So this line simplifies, tends to simplify pretty quickly. And here, bishop b4 is a common move, but Pinter chose knight c6, bishop c4, and now b5, which is another line which is played here. On one hand, this move helps to advance black's 2-1 to one majority on the queen side, chases white's bishop back, and may help to develop the bishop uh, from c8 on b7. On the other hand, uh, it can be a weakness. Uh, the advance of the queenside pawns can prove to be a weakness. White played bishop e2. Of course, white can't take the pawn because of queen a5 check. Uh, so now bishop b4, bishop to d2, and queen a5. There have been some games also with black taking on d2 and then playing a6, but white seems to stand a little bit better in those positions where he can uh, later prod the queen side with a4. Here black uh, might uh, usually go into, uh, this usually leads to a queenless middle game. So white took on b4, queen takes b4, queen to d2, bishop to b7. Uh, now if white takes on b4 and then on b5, black's initiative is very strong, and black immediately wins back material because of there's because there's a threat of knight c2 and also bishop takes e4. So here white played a3, covering the b4 square and forcing black's hand. So black took on d2. Uh, there's no avoiding the queen trade. King takes d2, and now a6, protecting the b5 pawn. So this kind of position is a... Uh, it can lead to sharp positions, as we see. Uh, there, there are different imbalances favoring each player. If black's 2 to 1 majority potentially can be an advantage on the queen side, but again, we'll see here how the, the advanced b pawn can be also shown to be a bit of a weakness with the move a4 becoming possible. In fact, that's what white played right away. On the other hand, white has also, or black has some, some pressure potentially down the d and c files, uh, use of squares on the queen side, pressure against e4, the potential break f5 is a very important thing to note, breaking up white center. Uh, for white's side, white also has a potential centralization uh, and uh, sometimes the use of the c-file as well. And the move d5, white can create a passed pawn. So it's a very positionally tense battle. And white begin with the move a4. So he's uh, forcing black to create a passed pawn, but his idea is to gain some control of queen set squares to eliminate the weakness on a3. Without this move, black would have a long-term, I mean, he can eventually create a pass pawn in any case, but he would have uh, chances in the long-term on the queen side because of white's weakness on a3. And so his basic idea is to gain, for instance, the c4 square and to weaken black's position on the queen side to strengthen this bishop, which will now be aimed at a6. So black had to play b4. If he took on a4, white could claim a clear advantage. Uh, black would have... Uh, Black would have a weak a-pawn, and also there are moves like uh, here, I think, rook to b1. Throwing this move in is good. Um, Black's bishop on b7 is awkwardly placed, uh, so white has strong pressure. Black played b4, and here white played a5. So he separates black's pawns, and this was apparently his idea with the move a4. The pawn on b4 is now separated in typical fashion, and so white hopes to then surround it and eventually win it. He also hopes to keep the a6 pawn blocked on 
a6, so black is, doesn't have a chance to play a5. But this move turned out to be too slow. While the move is, uh, is a positionally good move, it's a good idea to get this move in, it was, there wasn't time for it, really, or at least it wasn't the most correct thing, uh, because this gives black a chance to start immediate counterplay in the center. So it, it turns out more, um, more accurate was rook to c1, when white immediately gets the rook there. a5 is still not very good because white has bishop b5, and it's not good at all because of bishop b5, uh, and then d5 is coming. So now white gets the chance to play king e3, and black doesn't have quite the same counterplays in the game. Uh, because white's rook is active, There's there will be pressure immediately on a6 and c6, and black can't really play as he played. But white played a5, and now it was necessary for black to get some dynamic play going. Otherwise, white will achieve all of his goals. King e3, rook to c1, maybe maneuver the knight around to b3 and then c5. In the long run, black's position will just be squeezed here. So he has to get some counterplay immediately against the vulnerable white king, slightly vulnerable white king, and against the uh, central pawns and uh, create some tactical counter chances. So black played rook to d8, threatening the d4 pawn, king e3, and now f5, blowing open the center and leading to a very sharp battle. Um, if white were to just play e5, this would this would uh, not be good for white because now the d5 square falls into black's hands, for instance, knight e7. I think he'll also even play f4 here, but knight e7 minimum, and the knight's coming to d5 very powerfully. So that's not uh, good for white. And otherwise, black intends to take on e4, and then uh, if white has to take with the king, then there's discovered check. Knight takes d4. So white had to take on f5. Black took back, and now <coughs> Black's intention is, well, now he's isolated White's D-pawn. His intention is simply to castle, and then rook to e8, and start a very strong attack on the White King in the center. Fortunately for White, the, he's not without resources, and he has the move bishop c4, which keeps the Black King in the center and keeps Black from easily being able to carry out his his plans. This also gains some control over the d5 square. So white's intention is d5 to get this move in and then strengthen the pawn with uh, rook to d1 and so on. Um, and king f4 is also coming, and white's centralization again can overwhelm black if black does nothing in particular here. King f4, d, or rook to d1, d5, and either king f4, king d4, sometimes knight to d4 can be coming and white's, uh, white will control the center of the board, and again the b4 pawn will become weak, and black's king will be the one in trouble. But uh, Pinter played king e7, so he, he can't castle, but now he can still bring his rook to, uh, to e, e8, and his king will find a reasonably nice home on f6, where it turns out he even takes part in the attack himself. So this is black's intention, and again if white doesn't act, <clears throat> then rook to e8, and king f6 comes next. So white played d5 here, hitting the black knight. And if black backs down in this position, knight to b8, saving the knight, or knight a7, king to d4, and white has total control here. Uh, rook comes to e1, potentially to e6. The b4 pawn will drop off with uh, rook to b1 eventually. Knight could come into e5 as well. King can even come to c5. So it's uh, it's very difficult for black, and he has no counterplay here. So black was not going to back down, <clears throat> and instead he sacrificed a piece with king f6. Uh, so he's preparing rook e8, and white has to take the piece. Uh, or he also opens the e7 square. So for instance, if white plays rook to e1 in order to avoid allowing black a check on e4, then comes knight e7, and the pawn on d5 is lost, and white's position is lost then. So white took the knight, rook h to e8, king f4, and now the white king will end up in a very strange position, but of course white's up a piece, and it's, uh, it turns out surprisingly difficult to get to the white king. So here Pinter had a tough choice, and he played rook e4 uh, with the idea of uh, the, game, the game continuation, which we'll see. Uh, it turns out that white has an amazing defense that would save the game, but it's very hard to appreciate at this point. Nevertheless, uh, more 
uh, promising was g5. Uh, this is probably what, objectively speaking, Pinter should have played. g5. If white takes on g5, then comes rook to d4. King g3. White can't allow the pawn to be taken with check on c6. And now rook g4. King h3 again is forced because otherwise black takes the pawn with check and then both knight and bishop are hanging in here. Bishop takes c6. Uh, and this is uh, this is pretty much winning for black. Threat is bishop takes g2. Also the knight is hanging on g5 and the bishop is hanging on c4. So if knight f3, uh, then black can just take on c4. And black has a large advantage, probably just winning. Uh, his bishop is stronger than the white knight. The white king is still in trouble. The pawn on b4 is a strength in this position. Very strong passed pawn here. So this should be lost for white. After g5, instead of taking the pawn, white needs to play king g3. And then could come f4, king h3, and uh, bishop takes c6. Black has to remove this pawn. Bishop to c8 can be met by g4, and it turns out that it uh, leads nowhere uh, for black. Uh, with see similar positions, uh, but uh, here, here it's not, uh, even after h5, it's not going anywhere. Uh, so instead, bishop takes c6, which now after, now white has to be very accurate, stopping bishop d7, rook h to d1, h5, uh, and now Black threatens g4, but white has knight e1. So this kind of position, despite black being down a piece, well, he now should probably play bishop d7, at least on one of the... Eventually, he's going to have to play bishop d7 because there's no other way to... There's no way for black to bring up new attackers and mate the white king. After g4, the king always has a h4 square where he's safe. So ultimately, black will have to check on d7, and such a kind of position will arise... Um, where white has two minor pieces against the rook, and uh, probably the queenside pawns will be eventually traded, uh, leading to a drawish kind of position. Although it's still a big fight there. So g5 was actually more promising, but Pinter continued his idea with rook e4, king g3, and now bishop c8. So. Black has to do so he, something. He's down a piece. Bishop takes c6 would just allow, for instance, h3, and the white king escapes. So he played bishop c8. Um, actually, after bishop takes c6, white would have to guard the rook. I mean, the bishop on c4 with rook to c1, but still, after rook g4, king h3, this uh, leads nowhere uh, for black. Uh, so white has enough. Uh, white has enough. Uh, counterplay with the bishop takes a6 coming and black's bishop will be under under threat and rook to d1 is also coming so black is at, black's attack doesn't <clears throat> reach its goal here so king g3 so black's black played bishop c8 immediately taking his bishop to the key diagonal where he's he's going to be uh, aimed at the white king which will have to go to h3 if he checked first on g4 and then king h3 and here bishop takes c6 this also bishop takes a6 in this position and white again, should win this position. Uh, black's attack is not uh, successful. White has rook to d1 coming, uh, offering the trade of rooks, challenging d7. So it seems that black, uh, black goes nowhere with this. So Pinter played bishop c8, which was his idea. Uh, White's bishop on c4 is hanging, so white played rook to c1, protecting it. Without that bishop, of course, he'd just be worse. Rook to g4, king h3, and now f4. This is black's idea. He's down a piece, but the white king is caught in a little alley here on the king side. And from the first glance, it looks very dangerous for white. But then we start to see some resources for white. Here white played a desperate move, knight e5. The idea being that after king takes c5, white plays rook h to e1. Black king has to move, and then bishop e6, separating the black rook, uh, the black bishop from the rook, and leading to a kind of, well, I guess white's better here. Maybe it's, um, yeah, at least white's okay. Uh, certainly white's not worse. The pawn on f4 is weak, and 
black has chances to draw, but it's, it's in any case why it's not worse. Um, even that was not as good as what he could have done. So Knight e5, he found an idea trying to equalize, uh, or, be, or at least to get out of out of danger. Of course, it looks extremely dangerous, but this was, uh, and, and interestingly, this was the right idea, but the wrong execution of this bishop e6 idea. So first move, if white wanted to go for an equal, uh, go for a draw, uh, he had the move bishop takes a6, trying to deflect the black bishop. And now if bishop to e6, then white can continue to uh, chase the bishop with bishop c4. And uh, after bishop c8, uh, well, white could repeat moves, or actually he could play even better what we'll see in a moment, just minus black's a6 pawn. Uh, bishop f5, we also have moves like bishop d3, but there's also rook c5, which is even stronger. And despite black's double check, rook g3, king h4, it leads nowhere, g5 squares under guard by the white knight. And uh, so this, after bishop takes a6, black should make a draw immediately with rook g3, king h4, rook g4. And now white has to go back to h3 because if king h5 here, black has rook to d5, getting the, the rook into the game and uh, forcing mate next. So white would have to go back to h3 and black, despite the seeming, seeming threatening nature of the position, has nothing. White's getting ready to remove the bishop uh, and the game is a draw. However, so bishop takes a6, this was pointed out in the notes by Pinter later, the informant notes, but uh, there there was an idea, there's also c7, which looks very risky, allowing black discover checks and double checks. The bishop is not under attack on c8, so black has his choice of many possible moves, but uh, seemingly this move would have refuted black's attack. White's pawn takes one step closer, and it's uh, with tempo, and and this provides a number of tactical ideas. So after c7, the move Pinter gave was rook e8. We'll come back to the, that in a second and see the very nice answer to this move, which white has. Uh, but uh, first, let's look at some other moves. Rook to g3, the double check, leads nowhere after king h4, and now uh, black can't make a draw with rook g4 because after king h5, there is no more... Uh, there's no continuation to the attack. For instance, g6, king h6, and the white king is perfectly safe on the dark square with black unable to approach the h4 square. Of course, the rook is hanging and white's getting ready to go rook to d1, and that eventually will disturb the black king with a check on d6, so black's attack is broken. Rook g3 leads nowhere. There's also rook g6, uh, this, this uh, discovered check, with the idea that after king h4, rook h6 checkmate, but white has g4 here. And this, uh, uh, this uh, again, white leads nowhere. For instance, bishop takes g4. <clears throat> here white plays king h4. And the king is still safe. The black rook is hanging on d8. With check, by the way. So black has no time to do anything. Rook h6, king takes g4, leads nowhere. Black has to spend a tempo to play rook c8, and now white has to be very accurate, but he's just in time with counterplay with rook to d1. And again, the sixth rank gives white counterplay and allows white to win. Remember, white's up, uh, white's up a piece here already. Bishop takes f3, uh, would win black, win back, uh, black's piece, but then white is able to play rook d6 trade the rook on g6, um, for instance, king, king f5 is not possible because bishop d3 drives it away, so black can't keep any kind of mating net going. After king e7, white can take on g6, and then play bishop takes a6, and uh, the white king gets away. For instance, rook h8, king g5, um, and there's, there's no mate, white's getting ready to queen the pawn, so white wins. So this seems like white's hanging by a thread in these variations, but amazingly, uh, 
he survives. Also after g4, if black uh, takes on passant with check, then white just plays king g2. Black can take f2, but after king takes, then white's king is completely out of, har out of harm's way, and white's up a piece with the pawn on c7 uh, soon coming through. So that's that rook g6 doesn't work. Rook d6 trying to use the third rank looks promising, but white can now bother black again with this move rook to d1, trying to exchange the attacking pieces. So we're seeing a lot of defensive ideas here. White seeks to exchange attacking pieces and get the rook to the sixth rank where it will uh, where it will disturb black's king, which is actually part of the attack. So here, black can try rook g6. Rook g3 still doesn't work. For instance, king h4. And if rook g4, still white has king h5. And black uh, has no attack. The king is, again, amazingly safe on h5, as long as the black rook can't get to the fifth rank, which it can't. Uh, the, the, the d rook, that is. If rook g6, then here, again, white has to play g4. Uh, then bishop, if pawn takes g, g3 as before, king g2, and takes f2, king takes, and again black is losing. Uh, meanwhile, if bishop takes g4, then again king h4, white should play, not king g2, which would allow discoveries, but king h4. And the king is safe here. Uh, again, black's threatened with uh, the rook on d6. The attack, is, the attack is broken, and there's no way get, to get to the white king. Finally, we come to the move Pinter intended, rook e8, where the rook can in some cases be used on the e-file and it's out of the way of this, these, um, these uh, rook to d1 moves. Here, however, white has an amazing defense. The point is also black prepares g5. If rook h to e1, for instance, White has no chance, white has no time to check on the sixth rank because after g5, black is threatening rook g3 made, rook h4 made, and so on. So white's king is hopelessly caught. That's black's main threat, g5. Um, bishop takes a6 is again possible with a draw. After rook g3, king h4, rook g4. The king has to go back to h3 because if king h5, then rook e5. Deflecting the knight, knight takes e5, g6. So that's another point of rook e8 as it threatens this. Uh, and then after, then comes rook h4 mate. But even better than bishop takes a6 is the incredible move bishop e6, which was exactly the idea that Portish found with his knight e5, but it didn't work in that form. But here, the move, amazingly, not only saves the game, but even wins the game for white. Uh, if Because after bishop takes e6, well, of course, if rook takes e6, white can take the rook, and their the discovered checks uh, don't uh, lead anywhere, uh, because white's ready to take f4, and if black protects, uh, then comes king h4. And the white king is safe, um, or even king h5 as well. After bishop takes e6, the point is rook c6. And this is a very strange position because the king, white king looks as bad off as he, he as poorly placed as he was before. And now it's equal material, but there's exact material equality. And yet white is winning by force. The main point is white threatens rook takes c, rook takes e6. And if the rook takes, of course, this, ha this is hanging. But even if black protects the rook, then would be the pawn would be queening. And if the king takes, then comes rook e1, followed by taking the rook on e8 and then queening the pawn. So of course, the c pawn plays a major role in white's uh, defense. So black has discovered checks, but white's going to meet any discovered check by taking on e6, unless it's the double check. So the only move black can try is rook to g3. As we said, protecting the rook with h5 would be met by rook takes e6, king takes e6, rook e1, followed by taking the rook on e8. So rook g3 is the only tr variation left to calculate. King h4, and then black's only trying to make a draw. 
because again, white threatens to take the bishop. He also threatens to take the rook. So black has to try rook to g4, but white doesn't take the draw. He plays king h5. And again, the same threats of rook takes e6. Uh, black's only try is g6, but then king h6. And still white threatens rook takes e6, which will queen the pawn, because after king takes, there's rook e1. So black, surprisingly, has just no good defense to that. The only thing he can do is play rook c8. The rook on g4 is hopelessly placed. There are no checks. Rook g2 is again met by rook takes e6 or even rook e1. After rook c8, the only way to stop the pawn, but then comes rook e1. And the black bishop is lost and white wins. There's no danger to the white king. So very surprising variation. Amazing defense. Bishop e6. After rook e8, bishop e6. Putting the bishop where it can be taken three different ways. Sort of a a Novotny theme, as it's called, putting a piece at the intersection of lines. Part of it is to draw the black bishop into the pin, so it's not so much to block the e-file. But uh, amazing idea, which white could have used uh, after rook e8, and it seems that after c7, black is losing, despite the apparently promising nature of his position. But we'll just ignore this flaw in, the, in black's attacking masterpiece, which is very difficult to under, uncover, and in any case, we can also learn a lot from White's potential defense. Instead, however, Portis chose knight e5, aiming for the same bishop e6 idea, but this was losing. So here, very nice move by Pinter, king g5, bringing his own king into the attack. And now, of course, if knight takes g4, bishop takes g4. Portis might have missed this. By the way, there's a... Very beautiful checkmate that Black had here, which is not easy for a human to see. Um, but it was objectively even faster way to win. Rook to g3. Double check. Of course, the king goes to h4, and probably Pinter rejected this variation because he didn't see a clear follow-up. g5 is met by king h5, uh, and uh, there there was no mate. However, Black has... Amazing move, h5, aiming to open the h-file after g5, forcing white to take the pawn rather than occupy the h5 square. So the point is that if white takes the rook on g3, then comes g5. Uh, king takes h5, rook h8 mate. And turns out that after h5, there's no defense uh, to, to black's threats. For instance, white can try knight f7, which... Uh, aims to control h8 and g5, but then comes rook to g4. Uh, and uh, if uh, king h3, then once again g5. And there's no defense against uh, quick mate. Rook g3, rook, g4, or rook h4 are, are both mates that are threatened. Uh, and knight takes g5, king takes g5 doesn't help white either. Uh, so instead... Um, uh, after king takes h5, then here black would have g6, king h6, and here there's rook h4 because the knight was no longer covering that square. Uh, so that would have actually uh, been a faster checkmate, um, but uh, Pinter found also a very strong idea, king g5, bringing his king into the attack. And here the threat is rook g3 mate or rook h4 mate. These double checks are very powerful. And even if knight to d7, rook h4 is still made. So white had to make a forcing move with his, by, had to check the black king. He played knight f7. If instead knight f3, then also king h5, as in the game. Again, threatening the mates on g3 or h4. And here white can't, uh, white can only make a few more checks like bishop f7, g6 with the same threats, rook c5. And here, black can block the check with rook g5. Uh, and um, so, and and then, and then, uh, white's only move is g4. Black takes on g4, king g2, and rook takes c5. And here, black black's winning. Uh, black's up the exchange uh, with a continuing attack, and white c pawn is going nowhere. So it's easy win for black. So white chose knight f7. Now king h5, keeping the black king in touch with the white king and in touch with his rook, threatening 
rook g3 and rook h4. Uh, so either one of those would be a, the answer to knight takes d8. So the only hope for white now, the, the only defense uh, is to pin the rook with bishop e2. But Pinter had a nice deflection now. The white king is caught on the side of the board. The rook needs to be unpinned in order for black to win. Of course, white's not threatening to take the rook, but he's still you know, he's preventing black from, the black rook from dealing the, def, the final blow. So here, um, Pinter played rook to d3, deflecting the bishop. If bishop takes d3, then of course black can checkmate with rook g3 or rook h4. If f3, then once again black has the same checkmates because the bishop is blocked. If bishop f3, then black would take the bishop and then rook g3 mate. So white has played g3, and now became f3, breaking the bishop's um, the bishop's diagonal. Once again, threatening rook h4 checkmate. If bishop takes f3, black just takes, and black still threatens those those checkmates after king to g2. White escapes, but the knight is lost. So in the end, black's up a piece finally. Uh, so instead of after f3, white played rook c5, trying to get some counter threats against the black king. And now came a funny sequence with both sides checking on every move. Uh, so black responded to white's check with rook to g5 check, discovered check by the bishop on c8. White had to play g4, also check. Black took the pawn with the bishop, and after king to g2, took on e2, again a check by the rook on d3, and white resigned because after white gets out of check, then the rook is hanging on c5. Uh, so black has a winning material advantage. So really beautiful game, even though white had, a, a, objectively speaking, had a defense, it was, would have been incredibly difficult to uncover this idea of bishop of c7 followed by bishop e6. Not to mention that white seemed to have that black seemed to have other ideas after c7, but none of them worked, apparently. Uh, very nice king hunt without the queens involved at all from the very start.